Our scripture passage today comes from the Gospel of John. It will be chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. John 15, 1 through 8. And let us pray. Father, help us to hear your word today, that we would be inspired and, in, and the Holy Spirit would illuminate us, illuminate these words and let them come off the page and into our lives. We thank you for what you're about to do in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus is speaking and he says, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. This is to my Father's glory that you may bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. begin with this question, uh, what is the secret to living the Christian life? What is the secret to living the Christian life? Because, you know, as we, as we do all these prayer concerns and we just look around, we know it's tough to live in this world today, to maintain our walk with Jesus. I mean, not only all the adversities that we've talked about and mentioned and that we face, illness, trials, challenges, and all kinds of things. But the world has also gotten more anti-Christian. We're called intolerant. We're called haters. We're called bigots. Christians are viewed as narrow-minded if we speak against the evils of the world. And when we speak about things going on that run counter to the Bible, we get criticized. So, how can we maintain our relationship with Jesus Christ in the midst of all this hostility? How do we live the Christian life in spite of all that is going on around us? Well, just before Jesus is arrested, tried, and crucified, he spends some time with his disciples, and he gives them some truths to help them deal with life once he has left. And he uses imagery that could help us all as well. I don't know how familiar you are with vines, but uh, we, we have some blackberry and raspberry vines uh, that border our, our garden. And they produce delicious fruit. These blackberries are as big as your thumb. They're thornless, and that's, uh, that's a treat. Um, and as long as the vine, the little branches remain attached to the main vine... We will have cobblers and jams this summer. That was kind of a request to my wife, wasn't it? So. Amen. We'll come, yeah. But, but you might be asking, but Don, what do blackberries have to do with living the Christian life? Everything. Yes, because, I mean, other than blackberry cobblers for church carry-ins. So what is Jesus talking about in this passage and it's bearing fruit, bearing fruit. Now, what is the fruit that Jesus is talking about? What is the goal of a disciple? Is it just to secure our eternal home in heaven? Well, that's important. But when Jesus was ready to ascend to heaven, he gathered his disciples and he gave them what we call the Great Commission, go into the world 
and make disciples for me. So the fruit that we bear is helping others take the next step towards Jesus. And as we've, we've talked, this can bring on, it's a many-faceted issue. It may be the first step towards Jesus. It may be helping each other continue on. But we can do this in several ways. And obviously one of the uh, easy ways is re recommending our church or inviting others to come to church so that they get to know Jesus. But they can also live, we can also live a life that reflects Jesus. See, the goal is not to be a model Christian so that other people go, wow, what a saint. <laughs> No, the goal of a Christian is to live a life that others can go, I want what they've got. And that's when we can share and point them to Jesus. Everything we do should point others to Jesus. How we live our lives often says as much as any sermon could ever say about how Jesus can transform our lives and, and change us. The Bible speaks of the fruit of the Spirit. We have our little fruity drinks and our little fruity gummy, gummy fruities, whatever they are. And, and the Spirit gives us fruit to bear. Galatians 5 says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and, Tad, self-control. Isn't it interesting how these things all work together at time? <laughs> See, the follower of Jesus will have these qualities exhibited in their lives. Because these qualities run counter to our humanness, don't they? We're not, we're not good at being patient. We're, you know, in self-control, that's kind of a challenge, isn't it? But when someone sees us having patience in the midst of trials... They'll want to know more about how this is possible for them as well. Then there's how do we treat other people? Do we put others ahead of ourselves? What do they see when we think no one's watching? What do they hear us say? Do we sound like the rest of the world? Or do, we, do they hear something that's different from the world? See, that's what attracted people to Jesus he came and he spoke with such truth and authority that it captured people's attention. So how can we live this kind of Christian life? And Jesus says, abide in me. Now the NIV says remain. So there's a good uh, definition of what abide means. Remain in me. Remain with me. Remain in me. Abide. And a literal translation of the first part of verse 4 says, See that you abide in me. Be intentional. Maintain a daily relationship with me. Verse 10, which was beyond our reading, if you look there, and it's on the screen here, says, If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in His love. So Jesus is talking about a life of obedience. Interestingly though, Jesus is not limiting what He means to the Ten Commandments. Here's what He sums that up in verses 12 through 14. This is my commandment, that you love one another. As, as what? As I have loved you. No one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friend. You are my friends if you do what I command you. And so his command, sacrificial love, agape love. Agape is a, a Greek word for love that is outward focused. It is putting others first. It is the love modeled by Jesus. Jesus put us first and he went to the cross. 
Love for others, Jesus is saying, seems to be the key ingredient in living the Christian life. And this love for others flows out of our love for Jesus. Jesus says we must abide in Him. See, this is nothing that we can do on our own. Because left to our own, how do we act? Not very Christ-like. We let the humanness in us come up. Just as a branch cannot survive from the main, apart from the main plant, we can't survive without being connected to Jesus. If we are to have a Christian life, if we're to be known as Christians, if we're to have the kind of life that Jesus lays out for us, then we have to spend time every day with Jesus. Jesus said, I am the true vine. Abide in me. And probably this is never more evident than when we go through trials. Amen? Because this, I mean, when, when others see everything going great, they go, well, that's good. But when they see us modeling a Christian life in the midst of trials, it's like, wow. I want, I want that. I heard it said that a dry June makes a good corn crop because the corn roots have to go down deep to find the moisture. And when they go down deep, they're anchored better. See, in times of challenge, it's, it's then that our relationship with Jesus takes on a whole new dimension. We, we lean on Him and when we make it through, we see that Jesus has sustained us. And even when he seems silent, ever had that happen? God seems a little silent. That's when we lead, lean even deeper into him. And here's the key. Jesus said, if we abide in him, he will abide in us. Think about that. Jesus lives in us. What do we always say when someone accepts Jesus? I've asked Jesus into my heart. And we know it's not just the organ that's pumping, you know, all this all through, or the blood all through, but it's the inner part of us. We've asked Jesus to take up residence in us. When we maintain daily contact with Jesus, we, when we remain in Him, abide in Him, we can bear much fruit because He's living in us. He promised never to leave us or forsake us, to be with us till the end of the age. And in a way, Jesus has never left because He sent the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is that part of the Trinity that takes up residence in us when we accept Jesus, when we turn from self to Jesus. He lives in the life of of a believer. Now how does that happen? I don't know. <laughs> I'd have no idea how that happens. The story of a little boy that uh, the, the pastor had said uh, when you ask Jesus to be your Savior he, he comes inside of you. And the little boy said okay, he was sizing himself. He said how, how tall was Jesus? Well we, we don't know but I mean maybe he was uh, you know, 5'8", five, 5'9", five, you know, probably people weren't as tall back then. He said, 5'8", five, 5'8". Five, eight. Looks at himself, he says, well, if Jesus is in me, he's just going to kind of stick out all over, isn't he? Yep. And maybe that's the point. <laughs> maybe he sticks out from us. The Holy Spirit seals us for eternity and guides us and leads us you know, here, here's something that I thought this week. We all will abide somewhere or with someone. We're all abiding in something or someone. So the question is, who do you abide with? Who guides your life? Are you abiding in Jesus? Verse 6, he says, whoever does not abide in me is cut off and thrown away. Yikes. 
So how do we make sure that we abide? Because as we've said, this life is tough. There are challenges to our Christian life every single day. I mean, just the, the, the concerns we've listed here, the challenges, every day it's a, it's a challenge to our abiding because there's things, uh, like we said last week, who do you listen to? Because there's all kinds of voices that are vying for our attention, wanting us to listen to them. And these worldly voices are, are a challenge so here's the tough part. Do you realize what this guy in the picture is doing? What do we call that? Pruning. Ooh. I mean, almost in that first verse of our text today, Jesus talks about the Father pruning. He's the vine dresser. He's pruning. And pruning is required when we abide in Jesus. Because if you know anything about plants that need pruning to get the best fruit, the biggest fruit, you've got to prune them back. You've got to get rid of those dead branches, those unproductive branches. At the end of our season, Jenny is uh, always pruning back the blackberries, getting rid of the dead, getting rid of the, the extra that takes away from production for next year. And, and this same thing goes in our lives too. When we let sin remain in our lives, when we do not abide in Jesus, it stops the growth process. We, we don't spend as much time reading the Bible or, yeah, I don't feel like going to church today or, yeah, I need to go talk to my neighbor or whatever it is. Uh, yeah, and then, you know, one day leads into two, two days lead into three months, and next, and it's been five years since you did anything. I mean, it, it happens that fast. Mm -hmm. We stop looking for Jesus every day in our lives. I'm, you know, I, I try to be a proponent of be intentional about looking around. I mean, just like Hunter. I mean, this could be God's answer to the prayers because you were kind of concerned about this job because it involved guns and bulletproof vests. You know, let's look for God in those moments. Like the cackling baby. <laughs> Jesus said the Father is the vine dresser. The Holy Spirit convicts us. And I would say we've all had those convicting moments. Uh, you ought not do that, or <clears throat> look this way, or do that. You know, we, we've all had those moments. So Jesus dies on the cross to pay for our sin, to make it possible that when we are convicted by the Holy Spirit, we can go to the Father and say, forgive me for sin. And the Father says, because of Jesus and because of my love for you, you are forgiven. Not because we were in church on Sunday or because of this or that, but because he forgives us only because of Jesus. The Bible says, if we confess our sin, he is faithful to forgive us. We no longer have to carry that around. We don't have to carry around that, that sin that stops us from growing as Christians. And this is never more evident than when we celebrate Holy Communion. So I said, how are we able to have our sins forgiven? How are we able to prune away those undesirable parts of our lives? It's Jesus' death on the cross as payment for our sin that God forgives us. And we are reminded of that when we celebrate Holy Communion. 